On the 27th of May, 1661, crowds gathered here in the High Street, Edinburgh, to witness a public execution. Archibald Campbell, the Marquis of Argyll, was the first in a long line of covenanting martyrs. Such was the desperation of the authorities to put him to death that the king had not even signed his death warrant when he was executed. In his final speech, the martyr, the Marquis of Argyll, Archibald Campbell, spoke much about suffering. He said, many look on my condition as a suffering condition, but I bless the Lord that he that has gone before me has trodden the winepress of the Father's wrath, by whose sufferings I hope that my suffering shall not be eternal. I bless him that has taken away the sting of my sufferings. He went on solemnly, these times are likely to be sinning times or suffering times, and let Christians choose. Those who choose to sin shall not escape suffering, they shall suffer and may be not as I do here, but worse. Argyle was right. It would be a suffering time for thousands of those who would not sin against their Saviour and his word. A period was beginning involving severe repression, heavy fines, imprisonment and execution. This was the time of Scotland's greatest persecution. Frequently and conveniently ignored, it has become Scotland's forgotten suffering. God's Word tells us more than the way of salvation. It teaches us about all areas of life, including how the church should be organized. As the king and head of the church, only Christ can command how his kingdom is to be governed. The trouble begins when the church or state authorities require us to disobey Christ. This is when we have to make the choice that Argyle spoke of, obeying authorities and sinning, or obeying Christ and suffering. What do we do when we have to choose between suffering and sinning? Argyle was in no doubt it was better to suffer than to sin. Scotland received its greatest spiritual blessing during the Second Reformation. The Reformation extended from individual lives to families, congregations and whole communities. Remarkably, it took place during a period of civil war and instability. When Charles II came to the throne in 1660, he had the support of the Scottish Presbyterians. They supported him because he had sworn to the Covenants. Sadly, he soon broke his oath. And here in Parliament Hall in 1661, Parliament passed an act which at one stroke annulled all of the reforming work of the previous decades. Parliament also established the King as the supreme authority in matters of religion. Many of those in the Parliament had spent the previous night getting drunk. That's why it became known as the Drunken Parliament. The persecution only increased, and by 1663, more than 400 ministers were forced out of their pulpits for refusing to be reordained under Episcopal government, and for refusing to acknowledge the supremacy of the King over the church. They were told they must leave their parishes and not live within 20 miles of them or within six miles of Edinburgh. There was a similar exodus in England where 2,000 Puritan ministers were forced out of the Church of England rather than conform. One faithful Scottish minister was William Guthrie of Fenwick, whose ministry we covered in a previous film in 1661, Guthrie submitted an address to the Synod of Glasgow and Ayr for presentation to Parliament. The Synod approved it as containing a faithful testimony of the purity of our Reformation in worship, doctrine, discipline and government, in terms equally remarkable for their courage and their prudence. Two months later, his cousin and father in the faith, James Guthrie, was sentenced to execution. William Guthrie was determined to attend the execution and only the urgent pleas of his session prevented him from a gesture of support so dangerous to his life. He was finally forced from his pulpit and his physical health collapsed shortly afterwards. He suffered a complication of diseases and returned to the place of his birth, never to preach again. Well, those ejected ministers, unable to preach inside their own churches, began to preach in the fields. The local people wanted to go and hear their own minister preaching, so they went and listened to him. All these empty, vacant churches were filled by the King's curates, um, and they were told to take a list of all those who weren't attending the King's church. 
uh, which they did. Uh, this list was then passed on to the, to the local dragoons, or soldiers, who would use pretty brutal methods to, to go and extract the fines that were imposed on these people um, for not attending the King's Church. And one example was that that happened down in St John's town of Dalry, which led to the Pentland Uprising. What happened at Dalry? Well, there was an old man called Jock Greer who had been fined for not um, attending the King's Church. The soldiers came to his house and he was unable to pay. He, he, he was poor. And the soldiers arrested him, tied him up and took him out into the middle of the town and were going to roast him alive uh, on a red-hot gridiron. There was a small handful of Covenanters who were in the town at that time and they had witnessed this and they went to the old man's aid. Uh, there was a scuffle and um, the old man was freed but one of the soldiers was injured um, in this process. Those guys knew we were in trouble for this. So what they did then was go to Dumfries and they took James Turner, the man who was in charge of the Dragoons, and they took him hostage. And they thought, you know, if we make our way through to Edinburgh, this will give us a little bit more leverage um, if we come to speak to the, to, to, the, to the council here. And that band headed off from Dumfries. More and more people came and joined them. They went to Ayr, up to Lanark. Um, in Lanark, they, they renewed the Solemn League and Covenant and they made their way towards Edinburgh. By the time they left Lanark, there was approximately 900 people who had came and joined um, this, this first rebellion. Uh, but when they got to Edinburgh, they found access to the city was a no-no. The, the, the city walls were closed and they stopped uh, um, just outside the city on the Pentland Hills. But all the way up, they had been pursued by General DL and 3,000 um, of his dragoons. And outside the city, um, we have the Battle of Rolling Green, which took place there. It was getting late in the afternoon and um, it was starting to get dark. The Covenanters managed to get a good um, defence against the, the, the first onslaught um, of the Dragoons, but eventually they were overpowered. Being getting dark, the vast majority of Covenanters managed to escape into the hills, um, but there was about 50 killed on the field and another 80 who were captured and they were brought down here into the city. So the prisoners were brought to Edinburgh and many of them were executed. So that was the first attempt at an uh, armed rebellion, Royal Green. After Royal Green, fines increased, uh, the persecution increased. But a couple of times, the king tried to use a softly, softly approach in the form of indulgences. Uh, one in 1669, one in 1672. And that allowed um, those ministers who had been um, behaving peaceably um, to return back to their, to their churches, but only if they still came under the control of the bishops um, and still refused to preach that the king was not head of the church. Um, but really the next sort of um, armed rebellion was at a place called Drumclog, and that happened on the 1st of June 1679. The Covenanters had been worshipping in the field. Some had brought weapons with them for self-defence, and even if you go to Drumclog today, it's still a remote place, um, away from, they weren't doing these things um, under the noses of the authorities. But whilst they were there, they posted lookouts round about. Uh, someone had tipped off Claverhouse and the Dragoons that, they, that this field meeting was happening and they went out in search of it. Uh, the minister was preaching on suffering for Christ's sake um, and he had just begun the sermon um, when he heard a, a warning shot being fired by one of the lookouts. He turned to the congregation and says, well, you've had the theory, now it's time for the practice. What would usually happen was the Covenanters would attempt to scatter in all directions because the soldiers just couldn't chase them, chase them all. Uh, but this day they decided they were going to stay and defend themselves and they chose the, the ground well, they went to the opposite side of a bog and sent the women and children away over the top of the hill. Um, when Claverhouse came and his men um, found the Covenanters uh, formed up, he ordered them to, to leave the field, hand over the ministers. Um, the Covenanters replied by singing Psalm 76, um, which just infuriated Claverhouse and his dragoons, and he ordered his men to attack. But because the Covenanters had chose the boggy ground well, um, the heavy soldiers' horses got stuck down um, in the bog. And really that was the only reason why the, the Covenanters got this small victory um, against the Dragoons. But it was a victory and people heard about it and people flocked um, in their hundreds to come and join this, this, this group of Covenanters. Um, so they went to Glasgow, they found the city walls in Glasgow closed, they couldn't get into that city. They came back and they camped outside Hamilton, um, just at the side of Bodwell Bridge. By the time they were there, uh, there was approximately 3,000 people there by the time you get three weeks later to the 22nd of June. And they had poor leadership. I mean, these guys weren't soldiers. They were farmers, they were tailors, weavers. Um, they had a few professional soldiers with them, but they were, they were pretty much undisciplined. Um, but whilst they were there, the king sent up 15,000 professional troops 
to come and deal with this rebellion. And on the 22nd of June, they arrived at Bothwell Bridge and we have the Battle of Bothwell Bridge. The Covenanters managed to hold the bridge for a small part of the morning, but once these King's troops got over, it was just a slaughter. The official number is 400 people killed on the field. Um, there's probably a lot more. Um, there was a report afterwards that said that the local people found a pit with up to a thousand bodies in it. And that, that, that mass grave is still there somewhere at the woods next to it. Um, 1,200 people were all captured in one body. The majority of them were stripped and they were marched all the way from Bothwell Bridge through to Edinburgh. Edinburgh didn't have a, a, a prison big enough to deal with 1,200 people. So what they did is they brought them here to this walled off section of Greyfriars Churchyard. Uh, we have the Flodden Wall, which was part of the city old defensive walls, which went round. And they were basically herded inside this part and it was made into a sort of makeshift concentration camp. And they were kept here um, for, for several months. Some were taken out, offered the, um, the test act. If they took the bond, they could go free. Some died of malnutrition, some died of exposure. Um, some were tortured on the things like the, the boot um, or the thumb screws. By the end of those five months, there was 257 people left here out of, out of 1,200. Someone in Barbados had bought them as slaves and they were taken from here down to Leith Docks, put on board a ship called the Crown and they were going to go around the north coast of Scotland over the Irish Sea. Now that ship never even set sail for several weeks before it set sail. The Covenanters were down in the hold of the ship, no sanitation. The basic food they got was just thrown down a hatch, which landed on the filthy floor. Eventually the ship did set sail, but as it was going round the north coast of Scotland, it got caught in another storm and began to smash against the, the rocks of the Orkney Islands. The captain, he knew the ship was going to sink and he ordered his men to abandon ship. But he says, make sure you nail down the hatches because we don't want the Covenanters escaping. And that's not because he had any particular hatred for the Covenanters, but if his cargo went down with the ship, he got his insurance money. So it made no difference if his cargo was wool or, or you know, fish or whatever, um, people, as long as it went down with the ship, he got his um, insurance money. And that's what the sailors did. They nailed down the hatches and they all abandoned ship. Eventually, as it started, began to smash against the rock, a hole appeared in the ship and some of the Covenanters managed to escape out, but the sailors were actually throwing them off the cliffs back into the sea again. And from that, um, 257 on board the ship, 49 people or 50 people survived the actual shipwreck. Um, and and made their made their escape. The persecution became even more ruthless during the killing times of the 1680s. During this time, it was not possible to continue to be faithful without suffering. John Brown of Priest Hill was shot dead on the spot without trial in front of his family at the door of his house. In this quiet and lonely spot, William Adam, a young man, waited to meet his fiancée. When the government troops found him on his own reading his Bible, he was shot dead on the spot. Two months after the Battle of Bothwell Bridge, a young man returned to Scotland from Holland, and this was Richard Cameron, whose name would be commemorated later in a Cameronian regiment. Many ministers had stopped preaching in the fields because they saw it as too dangerous for both them and the people. Cameron, however, saw it as his duty to preach the gospel no matter what might happen. When he preached at a conventicle in November, 3,000 people came to hear God's word. The next Lord's Day, even more people came to hear him. In July of 1680, 120 government dragoons caught up with Cameron and 62 of his followers at Ayers Moss. Before the battle, Cameron prayed, Lord, spare the green and take the ripe. Cameron's men fought valiantly, but they were overcome and most were killed. The dragoons cut off Cameron's head and hands and in an act of terrible cruelty, they took them to his father, who was in prison in Edinburgh, and asked if he knew them. He replied, I know them, I know them. They are my sons, my dear sons. It is the Lord. Good is the will of the Lord, who cannot wrong me nor mine, but has made goodness and mercy to follow us all our days.
it fell to another minister, Donald Cargill, to continue the work of preaching in the fields. In 1681, he too was arrested and executed. Just before Cargill died, he wrote, This is the most joyful day that ever I saw in my pilgrimage on earth. My joy is now begun, which I see shall never be interrupted. His calmness in facing death had a great impact on those watching. One young man of 18 years old witnessed that execution. His name was James Rennick, and he would be ordained as a minister in Holland in 1683, before coming back to Scotland to begin pre preaching in the fields himself. Rennick kept on preaching at conventicles or illegal worship services. Two meetings took place here at Braid's Craigs in November 1687 and January 1688. It was a daring endeavour since it was less than two miles from the capital. He was arrested a short time afterwards in February 1688. The notes of the sermons from these occasions were found on Rennick when he was arrested and are thought to be incriminating, especially in relation to condemning the sins of the times and in relation to the doctrine of Christ's kingship. He preached on Psalm 46 verse 10, the famous text that Richard Cameron had preached on, be still and know that I am God, I will be exalted among the heathen, I will be exalted in the earth. And also Hebrews 10 verse 38, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Rennick certainly was not one who was going to draw back. Rennick kept on preaching but was finally caught in February 1688. On the day of his execution, some people tried to get Rennick to pray for the king, but he replied, I am within a little while to appear before him who is king of kings and lord of lords, who shall pour shame, contempt and confusion upon all the kings of the earth who have not ruled for him. His last words were, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit, for thou hast redeemed me, Lord God of truth. He was then hanged in the grass market in Edinburgh, the last Covenanter martyr to be publicly executed. The date was 17th of February, 1688, three days after his 26th birthday. The very last person to be put to death was a boy who was only 16 years old. His name was George Wood, and he was found by the troopers in a field near Sorn, and his only crime was carrying a Bible. That was in June 1688. A few months later, William became king and ended the Stuart regime and its persecution. Society is becoming increasingly antagonistic to Christian values and Christianity itself. Those who keep faithfully to God's word risk being ostracized with contempt as bigots by society and sadly by many in the church too. The church has become polluted with false doctrine and with entertainment masquerading as worship. The Covenanters suffered to preserve a legacy of truth for future generations, including us. But this costly legacy meets with sheer neglect and apathy today. We have not given it up because of persecution, but through either indifference or men-pleasing. If their sacrifice is not to be forgotten, we must be prepared to choose suffering over sinning. Music